Since its inception, the Ace Combat series has had a very simple and easy to understand premise. Fun, arcadey dogfighting action where the player takes control of a faceless ace pilot fighting against an equally faceless adversary. In other words, the story took a backseat to the action. But for the third game, Namco tried something very different, and the results were, perhaps, a little too ahead of its time. It's Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere for the PS1. <laughs> From the get-go, the development team wanted to create a higher degree of player investment than previous titles. To that end, they would no longer be a passive observer to the story, but an active participant. The true significance of this design philosophy will become the crux of this analysis later on, but for now let's go into how they went about doing this. Three features, an intricately crafted setting and story that spans five different routes across two discs. The player is able to influence the events of the story in both small and large ways. Your performance in missions can sometimes affect the cutscenes that immediately follow, which are often framed within this video call system where the characters speak directly to you. A lot of these same characters will also appear during missions as either enemies or allies, creating the strongest cohesion between the story and gameplay we've seen up to this point. <laughs> While this wasn't the first time voices could be heard over the radio in the middle of missions, this was the first time you could hear both friend and foe, and hear them interact with each other as well as you. This created an ever-changing narrative that allowed the story to go beyond the initial mission briefing. This approach is a lot less like a realistic flight sim and resembles more anime. Specifically, mecha anime. If you replace the planes with mechas, you essentially have an episode of Mobile Suit Gundam here, where everyone is seemingly on the same radio frequency, screaming about their opposing ideologies. It feels like a strong influence, especially when we take into account that Maria Kawamura is among the voice cast. An actress you've definitely heard if you're into Mecha. And while we're on the subject, did you know that Eric has the same VA as Goro Akechi? That doesn't have much relevance to anything, I just thought it was cool. The game's story is clearly wearing its anime influences on its sleeve, as many parallels have been drawn between it and the 1995 movie Ghost in the Shell. They're not exactly subtle about it, and even hired the same animation studio to provide the game's cutscenes. Free takes place in a cyberpunk-style future where multinational corporations have all but replaced the governments of the old world, eroding the very idea of country and borders. For the longest time, power had coalesced into the hands of General Resource, an economic giant with a military force to match. But more recently, their monopoly has been challenged by Newcom, a corporation made up of genius scientists who were previously exiled from General for their inhumane experiments. Their advancements in aerospace development and science are beginning to make their competition look antiquated in comparison, sparking a cold war between the two that eventually turns into an all-out intercorporate war. Stuck in between these two is a third faction, to which the protagonist is initially attached, Upio. They're a peacekeeping organisation that is so laughably ineffective they're often ridiculed as being a paper tiger. Finally, we have the wildcard group who were hinted at, but only make their presence known towards the end of each route. They're called Ouroboros, a transhumanist terrorist organisation with the goal of uploading all human consciousness to the Electrosphere, which is essentially this universe's version of cyberspace. At various points in the story, the player is given the choice to either defect or stay loyal to each of these organisations and branch the story in different directions. Each branch offers a new piece of the puzzle for solving the larger conspiracy at play, and only when all five routes are completed is the true ending shown. I'll be discussing all of this as it is essential to understanding Free's core themes and what made it so subversive. Firstly though, we need to go through each route one by one and really dissect what they're about. Needless to say, there will be spoilers. If you haven't played this game, I implore you to turn off this video and get on that, because it is quite a unique experience that works more as a cerebral fever dream than a point-by-point -point plot summary. 
After you've done that though, come back to this video because I need the watch time. Anyway, let's immerse ourselves into the strange real world of Ace Combat Free Electrosphere. Since it's the organization all routes start with, let's begin with Upio. The setting is introduced by the two rival Megacorp's respective propaganda news networks, which immediately lets us know that what we're seeing is not to be taken at face value. Each broadcaster is obviously pushing an agenda that reveals a lot about their parent company. We get the impression of a technological arms race as both sides boast about their newest innovations. General Resource, for example, has a puff piece on Rena Hirose, a girl with a rare skin condition that prevents her from being exposed to sunlight. She's able to fly thanks to a special plane prepared by, who else, General Resource, and currently serves as a fellow SARF pilot at Upio. Anyway, as previously mentioned, Upio's goal is to prevent conflicts between the conglomerates, with armed intervention if necessary. It's a noble cause that, on the surface, establishes the same thing the previous games did in their intros. We're the good guys fighting the bad guys. Our allies are all wide-eyed young idealists, and the delegate of the organization is a kindly old man suing for peace. He's an old-school politician that anchors us to some semblance of normalcy, something recognizable from our own world. If there's any character we're meant to identify with right now, it would be our wingman, Eric Yeager, who is rather simple-minded and doesn't think too much about the larger politics at work, choosing instead to focus on his humble role as a fighter pilot. At the very least, he believes in the ideals of Upio and only wants to do good in the world. However, we're slowly given hints that this old way of thinking is woefully outdated. The attitudes of the time have shifted from wanting to preserve the status quo to a desire to leave a mark on history. This is one of the few sentiments shared by the corporations, and even the commander of UPO himself, Park. Essentially, we're peacekeepers in an era that doesn't want peace. It's a dissonance that slowly builds a sense of unease, a feeling that there's chaos just around the corner. The characters realize this too, and start questioning if what they're doing really means anything at all. Every mission feels like it has some ulterior motive beyond peacekeeping like we're being puppeteered by hidden agendas and political machinations. This all culminates in the aptly titled mission, Scylla and Charybdis, where we have to escort the kindly old delegate Clarkson to peace negotiations. That is, until the escort is intercepted by General Resource. It's a mission we've seen before in Ace Combat. Shoot down the hostiles and defend the plane. Only this time there's a cruel twist that renders all of your efforts pointless. Suddenly you must make a difficult decision. Disobey orders or shoot down Delegate Clarkson and fellow SARF pilot Fiona. Take too long to decide and your own ally, Rena, will coldly execute the order in your stead. Continuing the Upio route dictates that we must down the plane, putting an end to Clarkson's ideals, or at least what we thought they were. It's at this moment that the old world is symbolically laid to rest and any preconceived notions we had about being a genuine force of good in the world are shattered. Once again, our reaction is mirrored by Eric, who is absolutely demoralized by this turn of events, and immediately suspects that they're being manipulated from behind the scenes. As it turns out, it was all a setup by Commander Park, who has aligned himself with Ouroboros to start an all-out war between the corporations. <laughs> The intro actually clues us in to his true nature as a deceptive warmonger who sees his subordinates as mere pawns. 
Eventually, he reveals his true intentions and declares that Upio will be helping Goroboros with their coup d'etat. Ironically, they ended up starting the war they set out to prevent, and are now allies with a genocidal terrorist cell. What was once a symbol of peace and justice, albeit an unconvincing one, has been perverted by Park beyond all recognition. While Renna's story is also important here, for now let's focus on Eric. I've mentioned that he's meant to mirror the player to an extent, and this also shows in his motivation. He openly admits that he doesn't really have one, and doesn't question it either. This changes as his moral compass is repeatedly put to the test, until, finally, he can no longer afford to idly stand by. He finds renewed purpose in crushing the Ouroboros Uprising and putting an end to Park's evil ambitions once and for all. Park! The final mission is a satisfying one. Both Eric and the protagonist single-handedly destroy the last of Park's forces and then finish him off for good. Without a place to return to, they fly off to an unknown destination. While it might seem like a depressing outcome all things considered, it does end on a hopeful and optimistic note. After all, the surviving members of Upio had managed to accomplish their original goal. They had restored peace and, in a small way, had kept Clarkson's old way of thinking alive. Alternatively, should you decide to prevent Clarkson and Fiona's assassination, they all defect to Nukom, since they're the only people not currently trying to kill them. Clarkson disappears from the story soon afterwards, having served his purpose, but Fiona becomes much more prominent. The story ties heavily into her sisters, Cynthia, who just so happens to be a pilot at Nukom. True to the company's forte, the Nukom route is heavily based around their advanced technology and aircraft. This is actually the only route in the game, and the entire series for that matter, where you're launched into outer space for a mission. But at the forefront of this storyline is their research into the sublimation process, helmed by the seemingly unimportant side character, Dr. Simon Cohen. Sublimation is the process of creating a digital copy of the human brain and uploading it onto the electrosphere. Cynthia is on the list to undergo this experimental procedure, much to the dismay of her sister, who feels like this technology is playing god. Even though they're family, they represent the opposing ideologies of their respective factions. Fiona, much like Clarkson, represents an old way of thinking that is deeply skeptical of such an unknown area of science. Cynthia, on the other hand, embodies the technophile mindset of Nukom, specifically the farthest extremes of it, which will eventually lead her to defect to Ouroboros. Before we can even get into Ouroboros, we must first introduce Abyssal Dizian. He's encountered very early on in the Upio route, and soon invites the protagonist to defect to General Resource. On a first playthrough, you probably don't have much of a reason to take his offer, but it's necessary to see all of the routes. You'll notice that he tries to tempt you with vaguely worded talk of changing the world and forging a new path. It's the exact opposite of Upio's policy of upholding the status quo, and echoes the ideology of the corporations. In Dizian's case though, this would prove to be extremely insincere, as we'll see later. There's just something off about Dizian. He's an ace pilot for general, but he seems to have his own hidden agenda. Even his longtime friend and wingman, Keith Bryan, seems to think so. Keith's a little reluctant to accept the protagonist at first, but after several missions together, they build something of a rapport. Especially if you choose to ignore your objective and help him out during a certain mission. He's a down-to-earth guy who is undoubtedly loyal to General. He's this route's equivalent of Eric, in a way. Ah, 
Everything becomes routine until the CEO of the company is mysteriously killed, and Dizian reveals himself to be the one responsible. He's the true mastermind fanning the flames of war from behind the scenes, including Park's actions on the Upio route. From here, the choice is yours. Stay loyal to General Resource, or follow Dizian to Ouroboros. There's actually two different versions of the Ouroboros route, one for Newcom and one for General Resource. They're different, of course, but all roads converge on the leader of the organization, Dizian, a man whose motivations are largely shrouded in mystery for much of the plot. Originally, he worked with the Newcom scientists at General to create the sublimation process and became the first successful test subject. However, the real Dizian was killed soon afterwards when General decided to terminate the project and everyone involved. He now only exists as data in the Electrosphere. And this is the Dizian we've been interacting with the entire game. And this would be his impetus to form Ouroboros and orchestrate a war between Newcom and General Resource. The ideology of the group, as you may have guessed, is a violent one. They want to destroy the old world and start a new one free from the materialistic desires of the flesh. They believe that the only way to accomplish this is to overthrow those who use these desires to perpetuate themselves. In other words, the corporations, the entities that profit from food, technology, and other such things. Once this is done, they'll force humanity to undergo sublimation and kill their real equivalents. It will not be a voluntary process, since they likely believe that any humans left alive would just recreate the government, which would, in turn, lead to the recreation of the corporations. Their end goal is some kind of transcendence to a higher form of enlightenment, free from the inherent flaws of humanity. This is what Cynthia also believed. Which is why she defects from Newcom when they put a stop to their sublimation research, mirroring how General did the exact same thing a decade prior. Ouroboros is the logical end result of both corporations' ideology, the desire to leave a mark on history and improve human life through technology, taken to the absolute extreme. Playing God, as Fiona described it. This utopian way of thinking is put under a microscope in both Cynthia and Renna's character arcs. Renna, in particular, has the most legitimate reason for wanting to leave her body behind. Since a young girl, she's been unable to live a normal life because of her condition. She was unable to connect with people, and this made her look towards the sky and dream of flying freely. She became a test subject at General Resource for an experimental aircraft, the Night Raven, which only she can pilot via a direct connection to her nervous system. This is where she met the sublimated Dizian for the first time. He taught her about the wonders of the Electrosphere. Because of her synaptic interface, she was able to link minds with him and connect in a way she couldn't with other people. Dizian became the first person she could trust. However, after the project was shut down, he abandoned her. In the end, he was just grooming her to one day pilot the Night Raven for his revolution. This betrayal devastated Renna, and once again she retreated back into her shell, never to open her heart to anyone ever again. She decided that the only thing she could trust was her wings, and that she would do anything to protect them, even if it meant killing her own allies. <laughs> In the Upio route, we see her try to live by this pledge, but is unable to do so. Her attachment to her allies, as well as her own moral compass, causes her determination to waver. As long as she remains human, she can never become what she wishes to be. A cold, unfeeling machine that flies freely in the open sky. And yet, this all changes during the mission Bug Hunt, after she's been infected with a virus that brings her very close to becoming a machine. 
This makes her realise that this way of thinking was just her way of escaping from reality. It was her own weakness and her inability to connect with others that she was running from, not her humanity. Sadly, she only comes to this realisation on the Upio route. In every other instance, she becomes a slave of Dizian and uses the Night Raven to destroy Newcom's headquarters, before being shot down by the protagonist. Her inability to see through her utopian thinking ultimately leads to her demise, and this same message can be seen in Cynthia's story as well. At first, she idolises Dizian as an Ouroboros zealot, but soon comes to confront him on his excessively violent methods, revealing his ulterior motive. Dizian never believed anything he preached. He was never a perfect being that had finally managed to transcend the inherent flaws of humanity. In actuality, there's nothing more human about his real objective. He simply wants revenge on those who killed the woman he loved, Yoko, and he's willing to see the world burn to make it happen. From the very beginning, Dizian was just a charismatic cult leader taking advantage of people's weakness, as a means to an end. He openly mocked Cynthia for believing that such a thing could even exist. There are hints that sublimation is like this scattered across the various routes, but the most significant one occurs moments before Dizian and Yoko's deaths. The second the sublimated Dizian is created, he's unable to recognise his human self, and declares that the man kissing Yoko is not him. At this point, they've become two separate individuals that can no longer be considered the same person. This crops up again during the Newcom ending if the protagonist joins Fiona instead of Cynthia, and ends up killing the latter. A sublimated Cynthia will appear before Fiona and tell her about the wonders of the Electrosphere. Her reaction to this is rather interesting. Instead of being relieved that her sister lives on in some form, she outright rejects it. Because this version of Cynthia is not her. It's a fake, a duplicate masquerading as her beloved sister. It only serves to remind her that, in the end, her sister gave in to her weakness, and successfully managed to escape reality instead of facing herself. At least, this is what Fiona would believe. Sublimation, by its very nature, creates a philosophical dilemma that has no correct answer and should not exist. It ties into the game's overarching warning about utopian thinking and playing god with technology, something that reaches its crescendo in the true ending. Throughout the story of Ace Combat 3, there's something not quite right. Even if you don't know what it is, it can be felt in every route, especially during the endings. At first glance, the ability to choose your route implies that there's a great deal of player choice, and yet there's one consistent event that takes place on every single path. The sublimated Abyssal Dizian is deleted once and for all. He's effectively killed off for real. This makes sense on all the routes where he acts as an antagonist, but what about when you decide to join him at Ouroboros? What happens then? Everything goes as you'd expect until we once again see a glimpse into Renna's memories, as we did on the Upio path. But there's something very wrong about this because this time, Renner is aware that we're seeing her memories. These are memories that had been repressed by Dizian so that she would help him, and yet the protagonist isn't just able to see them, but partially restore them as well. Dizian notices this, and quickly deduces that you're trying to turn her against him, for reasons unknown. <laughs> 
This, of course, leads to another decisive fight against Dizian. Only this time, with an unexpected twist, it should not be possible. Entering electric gear. An infinite sea of data that no one but Dissian should be able to enter. And yet, here we are, in a tense dogfight to the death inside of the Electrosphere. It's an extremely trippy mission with music that sounds straight out of a horror movie. The true horror isn't the murderous Dissian, however. At this point, he's a cornered animal begging for his life. No, it's actually the protagonist, who the player can name when creating a new save file. By default, it's set to Nemo. Latin for nobody. Sork! Simon! Simon. Remember him? He's that seemingly unimportant side character I mentioned earlier. Well, he's anything but unimportant, as we find out during the true ending. I think what makes the following scene so effective is the complete lack of music. It's so matter-of-fact in its delivery, so cold and detached that you can't help but feel chilled by it. この after this, Simon purges the Nemo program and releases it into the real world so it can bring about one of the possible outcomes, certain that no matter what happens, he will have his revenge on Dissian. You may not have noticed it, but it's always been there, integrated into every facet of Ace Combat 3. When you boot the game up, the Namco logo looks as it would on a computer starting up, each ending abruptly cuts off in a similar way to emulate a CRT screen turning off. Why does the main menu appear to have you shooting through cyberspace, only ever being interrupted by the occasional TV broadcast or video message? When you turn on Ace Combat 3, you're activating Simon's computer program and training his AI, which is you. You may assume that the story is being told from a third-person perspective. After all, we see events that the protagonist could not possibly be present for, such as Renner's memories from earlier. But this is not the case. It's all told entirely from the AI's perspective as it peers into the electrosphere looking for information, leading to some creepy, almost fourth-wall-breaking moments. Yes, yes. Iwasaki wasn't kidding when he said he wanted to make the player feel like they were there. He just didn't specify where. For all the freedom you're given to influence the events of the story, it all ultimately leads to the same conclusion. Even if you want to join Dizian, you're forced to kill him in each and every iteration. Because that's what you're programmed to do. The story was set in stone the moment you started playing. It's always a foregone conclusion. And the only choice you have in the matter is whether you get an A rank on the missions or not. This is, perhaps, a commentary on the video game medium itself. Any freedom given to the player can only ever exist within the framework of what the developers designed. Anything more than that is an illusion. An exercise in futility, a simulation of free will. You might say that it's the same escape from reality that Renner and Cynthia desired. Up until now, we've been looking at Ace Combat 3 as it existed back in 1999, as a sequel to Ace Combat 1 and 2. 
However, in retrospect, it would serve a much more important purpose in the series as a whole, and I think there's something to be said for looking at it in this way, even if it might have been unintended by the developers at the time. At the very least, it's possible that every game that came after 3 has tried to address its themes in subtle ways. I propose that Ace Combat 3 can be interpreted as the ultimate deconstruction of everything the series stands for. The Ace Combat series had a very simple and easy to understand premise. Fun, arcadey dogfighting action where the player takes control of a faceless ace pilot fighting against an equally faceless adversary. That was the plot to the first two games. We played as a mercenary pilot named Phoenix as he fought against a military coup d'etat. They were fun games, but you were never really there to question the plot, were you? It wasn't important. We're just the valiant hero fighting against evil. Later games would go back to this simple premise somewhat, but would give a much more nuanced take on it. It would humanise the enemy and give them clearly defined reasons for fighting. It was no longer good versus evil. It became about people fighting for what they believed in. Ace Combat 4 in particular takes some inspiration from the flying aces of World War 1 specifically in how they often had respect for their enemies. The reasons for this are numerous. Perhaps they saw themselves in the enemy, maybe they respected their skills. But no matter the reason, it's undoubtedly a very human thing to do. Humanity may have its inherent flaws, but there's also the inherent goodness as well. And this is what the later games tried to show us. Even in the middle of war, the inherent goodness of humanity shines through. At the centre of these stories was always a blank slate character representing us, who would bring about a brighter future through their actions. Their actions had meaning because we gave them meaning. We respected characters such as Yellow 13 because we came to understand them as people, not mere faceless antagonists in a video game. We were able to project these emotions onto the player character because the story encouraged and allowed us to. Free, on the other hand, has no such desire to indulge our delusions of grandeur. So much so that it will cast us in the role of no one. As a player surrogate, we can project emotions onto Nemo, but it's all rendered meaningless by the ending. Does Nemo like Fiona and Cynthia? Does it feel any respect towards Eric or Keith? Does it sympathise with Renna? It must in some way take these things into account when deciding which route to take, or else why account for all eventualities? Maybe there is a glimmer of humanity in Nemo, just like all of those other legendary aces from the previous games. But if there is, it can be overridden at any time by Simon. Any humanity we lend it goes unacknowledged. The truth of the matter is, we're not the good guy. We're not even the bad guy. We're nothing more than a killing machine being puppeteered by the true antagonist. A faceless blank slate in the truest sense. An existence that spits in the face of everything the later games would celebrate and embrace. It's everything that Dizian claimed to be, a perfect being that has escaped the inherent flaws of humanity, but in doing so has also lost the good as well. It has no ideology to fight for, it isn't motivated by revenge or anything else like that. It simply does what it's told to do, just like us. Isn't that what we've been doing in all of these games? When we played as Phoenix, did we ever question his motives? Did we ever question what the Rebels wanted or believed in? Of course not. We simply did what we were told and were given a round of applause. But Free refuses to oblige. The bad guy wins. The inherent goodness of humanity does not shine through in the end, and our escapism is not indulged. Interestingly, even after 20 years, Free still sits at the farthest end of the strange real timeline. 
It acts as a constant reminder of the dangers of playing God with technology. Just like Nemo's actions, all roads lead to this future as a foregone conclusion, negating any happy endings that might come before. It's a very nihilistic message that could one day be remedied by a sequel. It's a fitting ending for a cyberpunk story for sure, but maybe a little uncharacteristic of the Ace Combat series as a whole. It's a fantastic game that was way ahead of its time. So much so that when they brought it over to the rest of the world, all of the story was gutted. Yeah, everything I just talked about, all gone. It was replaced by some fairly generic story with no voice acting or characters. Thankfully, the true version of the game has been fan-translated by Project Nemo, which is what this video is based on. Anyway, I've been Stickity Slice, I'll see you around.